Well, good morning. And after this, it's probably not going to be. But this is Russ Barkley, the boomer's answer to Taylor Swift. That's right. Our song is that slam and screen door, which is the sound of subscribers heading for the exits off this channel. Thanks to this routine. Peace. Okay, let's get over to our dad jokes for the day. These again come to us from Spiceworks.com. And here's a few dad jokes for you. Did you hear the bad news about the paradox? They split up. That's a thinking person's dad joke. Let's have a look at this one down here. My wife is really mad at the fact that I have no sense of direction. So I packed up my stuff and write. <laughs> oh, that really is bad. This is even worse. What is wet and clammy? A clam. Oh, all right. So how do I keep all of my dad jokes straight? I keep them in a Dada base. <laughs> all right, that's enough of that. Let's get on to our four research articles for this week. I hope you enjoy these uh, and that you're entertained by my rather uh, pathetic display of comedy here. All right, first up is a review article that appeared over in Neuroscience and Biobehavioral Reviews this week on the social cognition in autism and in ADHD. As we know, both disorders experience significant interference in social relations. But as this review is going to point out, it's for very different reasons. The author does a comprehensive review of the literature on social cognition in these disorders. He defines social cognition as a multifaceted construct that comprises such things as theory of mind, mentalizing, emotion recognition, and social perception. He goes on to point out that in autism, the research evidence is robust for difficulties broadly in social cognition and especially in the identification of social interactions as social, you might say that, uh, and in implicit processing of social interactions, all very consistent with what we know about autism. In contrast, the difficulties in social cognition in those with ADHD are less robust of a more moderate size and appear to be primarily related to executive functioning difficulties. And to that, I would add, especially those dealing with emotional self-regulation. So a uh, very nice review there. Go over and have a look at it at Neuroscience and Biobehavioral Reviews. And as always, I put the links to these articles in the description. Next article is going to be on the Association of Maternal Diabetes with ADHD in the offspring. This is a review and a meta-analysis. And while you know that I like meta-analyses, there are some things about this review that long-term subscribers here are going to recognize as problematic. The authors went out and reviewed the uh, literature. And then on top of that, they were able to identify a number of case-controlled and cohort studies that involve more than 18 million study participants. And they go on to point out that they observed a heightened risk of ADHD in the children who had been exposed to gestational diabetes, any pre-existing diabetes, type 1 diabetes, type 2 diabetes, and so on. They found that the increase in risk was about 31% over the base rate in this population or over the control groups in some of these studies. So significant increase in risk. They go on to interpret this as a critical need for early intervention for offspring of individuals who had diabetes before or during their pregnancy. Now, what's wrong with this review? It's interpreting correlation as cause. Here we go again. I cannot tell you how many articles I see in public health, epidemiology, using huge samples and so on, that do not control for genetic risk. After all, the parents of these children have ADHD. Is it possible that ADHD is associated with an increase in diabetes risk? Why, yes, it is, as I've talked about in my videos on health outcomes. So the diabetes in the child 
might simply represent the fact that the mother had ADHD as well. Excuse me, I didn't mean diabetes in the mother or, or child. I meant diabetes in the mother was a risk factor for ADHD in the kids because of the mother's genetic risk. Let me say it very clearly. Diabetes in moms could be a marker for ADHD in moms. And it's not the diabetes per se, but the genetic risk itself. So there you have it. Uh, again, good review. It's very possible that the uh, metabolic and other neurochemical problems associated with diabetes, especially its effect on fetal brain development, could be there. I'm not saying it's not. I'm saying that this study can't show us the causal direction here. And we need to have better genetically informed studies on issues like this before we race off to the conclusion that it's the diabetes causing the ADHD in the offspring when it could simply be a marker for the mother's ADHD. All right, enough about that said. Up comes a, another review. This one, a systematic review article in Frontiers of Psychiatry. It's also a review and a meta-analysis. It's looking at transcranial magnetic stimulation in ADHD. It's, a, I think, a pretty good review. It identified 17 studies that met all of the inclusion criteria. If you're not familiar with transcranial magnetic stimulation, I've called up a few images here uh, on Google to show you what this looks like. What is happening during the treatment here is that they are taking magnets and sending pulses of magnetic stimulation into the brain, especially into the frontal lobes in the case of people with ADHD. So that's how it's working. These magnetic pulses go through the skull into the brain and are believed to affect functioning of these neural networks. By the way, just as an aside, I also found this image of somebody undergoing TMS and kind of looks like me, huh? Well, it's not, but I thought it was rather funny to see that anyway. So let's go back to the article and find out what they concluded in this review. They concluded that there were no significant differences between intervention and control groups from TMS in things having to do with motor evoked responses, motor thresholds, cortical silent periods, the ipsilateral silent period, not sure quite what that is, and in intracortical facilitation, no differences. However, there was a reliable difference in the short interval intracortical inhibition signal, meaning that TMS increased cortical inhibition abilities in ADHD and that this was significantly associated with improvement in ADHD symptoms. They go on to argue that this particular signal on TMS, this short interval intracortical inhibitory signal, could be a biological marker to use in the diagnosis of ADHD. That's going to need a lot more research before that pans out, but it's an interesting possibility. So overall, the review concludes that TMS may well help in improving ADHD symptoms via improving cortical inhibition. However, the authors point out to their credit that these are all very short-term studies, that some of them lack appropriate scientific rigor, that we need studies that go out for longer periods of treatment and follow people up longer afterwards to see if the improvement sticks, if it persists. And we don't know that just yet, but a good review there as well. Oh, let's get rid of that image. We don't need to see that guy again, do we? All right, finally, we have a paper on co-occurring mental health problems in teens with ADHD who do and do not have sleep problems. So this is a study that compares relatively small to moderate size groups, 56 individuals, teens with ADHD who had sleep problems, about 25 with ADHD who had no sleep problems, and a control group of 56 without ADHD. And of course, we do know that ADHD is associated with increased sleep problems. That was not the point of this study, however. The point of this study was to determine what other mental health problems might these teens with sleeping problems be having that the teens with ADHD who have no sleep problems don't have. And what did they find? 
the biggest depression and anxiety, which makes perfect sense. And one could argue that that clearly would add to the burden of sleeping problems going along with ADHD. But let's also not forget, it could also be that teens with sleeping problems have much worse ADHD symptoms, more daytime inattention because of the sleeping problems, and that those might well be contributing to the depression and anxiety. Again, correlation, not causation here. But interesting, the authors argue that where we see teens with sleep problems, we should go further and assess them for any comorbid mental health conditions. Okay, well, Boomer Barkley is signing off here. Peace, love, dove. Thanks for joining me on the channel this week. I'll see you again next week for more commentaries and research reviews. Uh, and if you're not a subscriber, once again, pandering for this channel, please subscribe or recommend us to others if you think it would be of help to them. Well, I hope you got a good laugh out of this morning's presentation. I will see you next week. As always, live well, be well. Take care. Bye for now.